As you can see, the title of my sermon is What the Devil Looks Like. Oh, that's right. Uh-oh, is right. And there are actually many depictions of the devil in all sorts of media, and almost all of them differ in some way. Uh, in games, there's like powerful beings that are the size of titans in games like Diablo and Devil May Cry. And there's also like in games, classically drawn cartoons and Cuphead, and that became a show. In the book Dante's Inferno, the devil is a bat-like humanoid being frozen to his waist in ice with three faces. And each of those faces is chewing on a different sinner from history. One of those, Judas Iscariot. And actually, the interesting thing about Dante's Inferno is it's what's informed most of modern depictions of hell come from Dante's Inferno, not from the Bible. Just a side note, but as a reader of that book and the Bible, I would like to make that distinction. What you're seeing on TV most of the time came from Dante's Inferno. Movies use depictions of the devil all the time. A scary yet traditional version exists in uh, Tim Curry's portrayal in the movie Legend, where the devil is a goat-legged, red-skinned, black-horned being with a big, powerful body and Tim Curry's iconic voice. Viggo Mortensen portrayed a sleek yet unhinged, eerie devil in the movie Prophecy, where he looks like Viggo Mortensen. <laughs> All of these varying depictions are not what we are talking about today. I will not be painting a picture of the devil for you. We are talking about the things that are unlike God and thus have the devil's fingerprints all over them. But what are those things? If you ask Bobby Boucher's mama, he might, she might say little girls, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, school, astronomy, Dick Clark, playing foosball with your friends, and Vicki Valancourt. <laughs> the first one of the things I will be talking about today is the compromise of your morals and your beliefs. The devil's modus operandi is simple, to corrupt your soul away from God. He is doing that today by muddying the waters of what is right and what is wrong. His attack is not blatant. It's very under the current. Things that were kind of okay in your mind are actually sinful, and the devil is peeling you away from God. There are lines we all won't cross, but he scoots you closer to that line every day. What are some of those things? Well, the first group is pleasure consumptions. Alcohol, drugs, food, spending. He warps your mindset around, around those things, and some of them are blatantly bad, and he gets you anyways. But some of them on the surface really aren't that bad at all. But you are forming addictions to things that are not God, and they can become your personality. I think we all know somebody whose personality is their vice. And there are other people who have a vice, and it's not their personality, but there are people whose vice has gotten them so heavily that that is who they are. In order to get the fix of some of those things, you have to leave the godly behind and chase the world. You'll find yourself in places, events, parties, situations that you would have never been before. And yes, I said food, too. Many people are failing to care for their temple. Junk after junk, spending God's blessings on the very thing that's making them have to pray in the first place. Pleasure consumptions are dangerous because they are highly addictive. All of them. Yes, even the ones that are non-addictive, not habit-forming. I think some people need to hear this. Just because it's not habit-forming or addictive in nature doesn't mean you aren't. You are habit-forming. Addicts will get addicted to anything. The reason it's addictive may just be you, not the substance or the drink or the food or habit. And that's something you have to understand because you can replace one habit with another and get addicted to it. And really, all the while, you're still not addicted to God, and that's a part of the problem. So many people are addicted to the escape of their pleasure consumption, but therein lies the problem. God should be your escape from the world. The truth is you can't escape the world by going and getting more of it. Don't listen to the culture on this one. Party life is not good for you. Fun and good are two different things. You are not going to find things that are good for you there. Parties and fun aren't inherently bad, but the lifestyle that it predicates becomes bad. 
Wanting to provide is an admirable, admirable concept, except when your paper chase leads you away from God. Money is not evil, but in your pursuit of it, many people will be led to do evil things. You must always remember God is the provider. Work hard and be dedicated, but make sure that dedication is to God. The second problem that, you, that comes around is physical pleasures. And yes, we got to the part of the sermon where the pastor is going to talk about sex. Let me preface all that I'm about to say with this. From a married man, sex is a good thing. God created it. As a way of expressing your love and passion for your spouse, it is a key element to a healthy marriage. I recommend all married couples to be expressive and free with each other and cultivate an exciting and rewarding life sexually with each other because God created that for you. Now, <laughs> sex in society has been perverted to such an overwhelming degree. Every movie, every show, sex, 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 every other scene, somebody's naked for no reason at all. Scroll through socials long enough and you're going to see debates on sexual topics with concepts that are beyond the pale. The pornography industry is more available and out in the open than it's ever been. The devil is strong at work in that environment. If you listen to the devil and the world, he will lead you to promiscuity and perversion. He is doing that for a reason. God created the institution of marriage and it is vitally important to the kingdom of God. He wants to undo that. The devil is doing everything he can to make marriages fail before they even happen. And sex is how he's doing it. Let me break your heart. If you have to change your entire life and all of your sexual habits in order to facilitate a marriage, when the time comes, you are likely going to fail. Nowhere else is that even a thought. People don't say, well, I'll start showing up to work on time and doing a good job when I get that promotion. They show up to work on time and do a good job and then get a promotion. Promiscuity is warping your mind. It is not good for you. Promiscuity won't make a wife, but also it won't make a husband. This idea that it's different for guys is, is, is stupid. Both partners have a responsibility to the other to be faithful and true. Men should not take pleasure in treating women like sex objects. If you one day aim to be the leader of your household, that starts now. Act like a good man now. That starts with having more respect for yourself than to just have a bunch of random sex now. That starts with being able to say you've always been the man your wife deserves now. You don't have to worry about me. I've always sexually conducted myself like a good man. Those are the kind of thoughts you need to be able to convey to your wife. And lastly, for men, because I want to help them, be stronger than that. Stop blaming women for promiscuity. You can't have sex alone. So if you don't like the idea of women being promiscuous, stop going to bed with them. If you can't say no to a woman just because she offered, you are weak, and that's not a good trait for a husband to have. Fix that. Now on the subject of cheating, because the devil's strong at work in that environment too, cheating is always wrong. There is never an excuse. Don't listen to society. Dedicate yourself to one person and one person alone. Going through a tough time sexually or a dry spell is not an excuse. Being drunk is not an excuse. Being a man is not an excuse. They made me feel good about myself is not an excuse. The devil is going to make it seem like it's not so bad, but it is. Emotional, sexual, financial, all types of cheating are deplorable and you shouldn't do it. I'm going to close this part of the sermon with these final thoughts. If you wouldn't watch the show or movie if they took the sex scenes out, you need to be careful what you're consuming. It's warping you. If you need to have more than one night or one more night of being sexually crazy before marriage, you're missing the point and you're probably not ready yet. Pornography is not good for you. It's wrong and it has damaging side effects. That is not coming from a pastor. That is science. If you don't like pastor in the Bible, check with science. It will tell you the same thing. Sexual freedom is an amazing thing, but you need to use it with your spouse. Sex is not just some cheap pleasure thrill. It's a beautiful thing that God created to be sacred. Between a man and his wife, it is the way you convey your deep love and attraction to someone in all the elements at once, physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental. It is a touching and rewarding part of life, and do not let the devil destroy that.
Society is trying to kill that. And that is such a beautiful thing to be destroyed because God created that with purpose. What else does the devil look like? A lack of love and empathy in your heart. 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. If the devil has in fact corrupted your heart, he makes you more like him and less like God. Less loving. As a Christian, you should be Christ-like in your love, which means you don't get to be choosy with who you love. You don't get to disqualify people because of political party, race, orientation, their belief system, a choice they made in the past, a topic you disagree on, a lifestyle choice you think unbecoming. God expects you to love everyone, even your gay atheist coworker who doesn't agree with you on political topics, that relative who's fighting with you right now, if you aren't choosing love, you're choosing the devil. The world is full of people who need God's love, and he entrusts us to share that with them, regardless of our estimation of their worth, because God's estimation is this. We were all once sinners, and without Jesus' death and God's grace, we'd be right there with them. It is an honor to be able to represent God. By choosing not to love, you are spitting on that honor and disrespecting God. The devil will make you lose your love by having you identify with everything other than that call to love. A thousand hot button issues you can get wrapped up in. There's political voting fights every year. A bunch of moral issues you can get wrapped in and make your personality and a plethora of other divisions. Love should be the solid foundation for your life. Division is like a crack in that sidewalk. It's how the weeds of hate start to grow. And through them, soon the path of love becomes just a, a grassy patch of hate. I think we've all walked by neighborhoods that haven't been cared for, and there's grass covering the sidewalk, and it almost looks like the sidewalk grew into the grass and not the other way around. That's how your heart can become. It almost looks like love is growing in from the hate, and instead it should be love as the foundation. And when the hate springs up, you clip it like you should bad weeds. The devil will even trick you into thinking you are doing the right thing by being unkind to a group of people. That's never the case. That is never the case. If you find yourself at your computer or phone typing away another hate-filled argument, your heart full of rage, consumed by your desire to just shut them up or teach them a lesson, you're starting to look like the devil. If you can't be kind to your coworker because you disagree with their lifestyle and what they're choosing, you're starting to look like the devil. If you laugh and hit reshare at another post filled with vitriolic statements about a marginalized group or a group that you deem deserves it, you're starting to look like the devil. Truth is, a lot of Christians I see on the internet, and this may hurt some people online if it does. <laughs> Truth is, a lot of Christians I see on the internet would argue with Jesus in their comment section. He would comment on their post and they would get into a debate with Jesus. Or they'd scroll by his post on a Tuesday afternoon because he implored them to love other people, regardless of where they stood on the trending topic. Maybe you fell into the other trap the devil lays and your heart is hardened to other people. You started to lack empathy. You stop being understanding and forgiving. In other words, Christ-like. You are the type of person now that withholds everything except your judgment. Where I see this most is between the older generations and the current and younger ones. We have got to stop that. They need us, our support, our experience, our love, and our gentle guidance. We need to evaluate, too, because sometimes they're making a good point. They're not always wrong. They're just trying to change the world for the better. And sometimes they pick the wrong battle or they get the truth mixed, but their hearts are in a good place. You know, my middle child, Caden, is on the autism spectrum, and I thank God every day he's alive in this day and age because there's more understanding and empathy now than there's ever been, even when I was a kid. He'll be able to find acceptance easier because of this current generation. And, and sure, there's still hurts and, and bullies and mean people and people who don't want to understand. But my experience as his father is that he is far less prone to that now than he would have been years ago. He is more prone to compassion now. 
So I can never hate this generation. I aspire to dip my feet into the pools of acceptance that they swim in. It's just a bunch of love-filled world changers. That's what we need most in the church right now. If you ask me what we need, it's young people. It's those people who want to do something for the world. They don't know it yet, but their heart is telling them to do something godly, to love people, to change people's hearts. They are dying to make an impact, so it's time for us to drop our pitchforks. Let them make mistakes without hate. Yeah, they may hurt you from time to time. Take that on the chin and move on, because we should know better than to think we were perfect. Each generation has made mistakes. Each generation has gotten some fights wrong, but also each generation has been right and made a big change, and we should support this next generation on the big change they're trying to make. And how do we do that? With love, with God's love, and fill them with the love of God so they make the correct changes. We can do this for them. We can help them. We can guide them. But too many people lack empathy because they're frustrated with the wrong type of generational hate. If your love for others is predicated on your ability to agree with, to agree with them, I want you to listen as close as possible to this scripture. I want you to look it up, print it out, share it on Facebook so it's forced to pop up on your memories. Put it as a note on your alarm in the morning. Do whatever you got to do so it's not forgotten. Matthew 5, 43, 47. That should be right up here on the screen with you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. There's an undertone of that scripture that I'm going to touch on later. And Matt, you could leave that on the screen, that last little part right there. And I'm going to touch on that later. You can't be a Christian and exclude people from grace because they're making mistakes. Here's an example. In this country, there is an opioid crisis, and many people are addicted to prescription medications. They need grace. And the truth is, they are actually often the victim of a broken system that did nothing to protect them from addictive side effects of medicine most of them needed in the first place. Want another? I got more. Some atheists hate you for serving God. Some of them were once believers, but they were hurt, and that hurt or confusion made them drift from the path. They need grace. You know, Saul was a persecutor before he became the Apostle Paul. That may be a lot of people in the world right now. They may be in their Saul phase, and you can love them into Paul, the Apostle. We need to win their hearts back, not fight with them. You have to be empathetic to others because God was first empathetic with you. Jesus came down. The reason I love the scripture, Jesus wept, is because it shows his empathy. And I love the fact that I serve an empathetic God, that I serve an empathetic Christ. If you go to 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction, listen closely, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort of which we have been comforted by God. It doesn't get much more plain than that. The devil wants you to make your heart hard to the world, and he is tricking you. There's a difference between turning from the ways of the world and turning from the people being destroyed by it. He will take the Christ-like empathy out of your heart if you let him. Now, I'm going on to the final point here, and it's going to ruffle some feathers. And I'm kind of sorry about it, but I'm not really. Let's get some feathers ruffled now. What's the final thing that looks like the devil? A church that got too political for sinners. Mm. This is the cause of death for many a church. For me, personally, the separation of church and state helps us just as much as the government. I don't want politics in my church because the words that come up with politics just don't sound like God. Division, mudslinging, partisanship, hate, separation, corrupt, greed, uh, dishonesty. That does not sound like God to me. Listen, the pulpit, the pulpit isn't the place for lobbying on behalf of what you're going to vote for. 
The words of the Bible should not be used to galvanize your political cause. Yes, we can all vote freely, and your faith can and maybe should affect your vote. You use your rights to practice your civic duty as you see fit. But the church should not have a sponsored candidate. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. We are after hearts, not votes. Tithes and offerings are not meant for political donations. And let me, in you, let, me let you in on a little secret here, because I see this mentality on Facebook, and I just want to kind of, you know, snap it and just let it die forever. If we get every Christian way in the election, we go down the docket and win every single battle so that we make illegal everything we deem ungodly, we wouldn't save a single soul for God. I read the Bible. The law don't work. That's why grace came. The Bible works like this. If you ever want to know why the Old Testament exists, this is part of it for me. The Old Testament is full of laws and strictures, and you have to behave your way into salvation. And when you study it and read it and you learn about these fantastic, magnificent people doing great things and they still failed the law, there is absolutely no way you read that and think, I could do that. But in the New Testament comes Jesus. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He fulfilled the law. And by acknowledging him as your savior, you get the covenant of grace that says, I've made mistakes, but they got wiped from the book. I now got an address in heaven, baby. Oh, to reiterate, if we change laws and not hearts, we may as well just be an Uber. That's only destination is hell. You can vote on things. Just don't put your faith on fixing the country in the box you checked at a school in November. The devil wants you to get so hyped up on identity politics that you can't properly disciple for the kingdom. He wants pews full of divisive, controversial religious people who think hating on people and judging them out of the church is the right thing to do. The devil loves a church full of sanctimonious believers. You know who I hope makes up this church someday? Ex-addicts, reformed criminals, converted atheists people trying to change their once promiscuous ways, marginalized groups, people who've contemplated suicide, men and women with lots they're working on. Because that means we've saved people. That means we've reached who needed reaching. And we found more people just like us. Church doors ain't meant for closing. Open doors, open hearts, open minds, open Bibles. Those are the things that look like God. I've said it before, and I'll say it again and again until the day that I die. If someone spends Saturday night at a club cheating on their wife, leaves and goes home to a, or goes to a hotel to shoot up drugs and get drunk until they pass out, and then they wake up on Sunday morning and stumble into the door still smelling like booze, I rejoice in that because thank God they are here. Yes, Sit down wherever you would like. Enjoy the worship. My wife can sing. Listen to the word. Do you have a Bible? Do you know Jesus? I think a little food might help with that headache. Do you have a way to get yourself some lunch? If not, let me order you something. What's your name, man? We got mugs, shirts, keychains, stickers, bumper stickers, anything you'd like, just take it. Come back sometime now that you know where we are. And hey, before you go, I just need you to know God loves you and so do we. Now, remember, I said there's an undertone to this scripture, and I'd get to it. So here it is. You are not called to people who make you comfortable. You are called to situations and peoples and areas and groups that might make you uncomfortable, that might reject you at first, that might not want to hear the message, but you are still called to them. And because you are called to them, you have a duty to love them, and you have a duty to forgive them, and you have a duty to not fight and argue with them and not bicker with them. You have a duty to be the bigger person. I hate to break it to you, but when you accepted Christ, you stopped being able to just sling mud like everybody else. The lost are not what we are fighting. They are not the enemy. They are the prize. Their soul is precious to us. The reason we, we rage war on the devil is for their soul. We are fighting for the lost. Making sure they feel the love of Jesus is paramount to us. It is paramount to a good church. My enemy is anything that looks like the devil at work in people. Every lie that's told about faith and Christians, 
every earthly problem he uses against people. Every time sanctimony led a Christian to refuse to, min to minister to somebody, every dirty trick, every sin, but never the lost. I love them. I was one of them. And had it not been for Jesus, I'd still be. They go through the same things I do often. Only difference is I live in that new covenant. I get grace now. When I see them, I don't want them to stay away. I want them near me in this church so I can be sure they feel the presence of Jesus in their life. Every person that walks by this church, I treat this situation, and I think everyone should, that we might be the last chance they get at hearing God. We might be the last chance that they get to be loved by somebody, that they get to experience God. So when they come in the doors, we got to love on them. We've got to love on them because I don't want them to leave not having experienced God. I want them near me so I get the chance to pray for them, to love on them, and maybe they stick around and I get to celebrate some answered prayers with them. The devil wants closed-minded Christians to close the doors of their church so they miss open chances at open hearts to the Father. One of the hurts that burns most as a pastor is a church that's got conditions for loving people. A church that's making choices that don't bring people in but chases them away. Because once they leave out these doors and the covering of a church family, the devil is waiting around like a Roman lion, right. seeking something to devour, and they may as well be wounded gazelle. That don't sit well with me. Churches, all churches should be. But I promise you this one is and will always be a place where the lost and broken come to find the love of Jesus so that hole in their life can be filled and they can get the grace of God in their life. A place where people feel loved and protected. A community of life like like-minded people and people helping one another to live a Christ-like life, covering each other with prayer and sacrifice, a place where anyone can come in during any service, any event, any day and find family. A place where imperfect people get together to worship a perfect God. On the TVs out the doors, right out there, is a message I made sure specifically can be seen. You are loved. Be the real you here. Do you know why that matters to this church and why it matters to me? I can't love you if you're not being you. If I don't get to know you I don't get the chance to love you. And God has put it on my heart that I have to love you. So as long as you play your role in this building and you are yourself, then I could do my role and I could love you. Stand, and we will close with this. <clears throat> what does the devil look like? feel like I did a lot of work in this sermon, and I'm just going to strip that all away and make it super simple right now. What does the devil look like? Anything and everything that doesn't look like the love of God. Father God in heaven, we thank you today for the opportunity to usher in love into people's hearts. We thank you for giving us the honor of being how you love the lost. You gave us the love so we can spread it, God. You have shown us, God, what the devil looks like. It looks like decaying morals. It looks like a lack of love and empathy. And it looks like a church that just has its heart not on sinners. Well, God, today we are praying, God, that you protect our morals, you protect our beliefs, and you don't let us get muddied by what society says, God. And we ask today that you make us have a loving heart. And for those of us whose hearts was hardened and lack empathy, open that up today, God. Change that for us today, God. And I pray that you put a protection over this church so it continues to be what it is, a church that is focused on the lost, a church that loves the lost, a church that says, come to the Father, and I will show you him. Father God in heaven, we thank you again today for the word, for the people, for the worship, but most importantly, God, today we thank you for you. Amen. I love you. You're all dismissed. <laughs>